causes of World War One, and you're going to learn the main M A I N causes. And you guys have already previewed some of these through our lessons about imperialism. I bet you can guess what the causes were of World War One. It was a pretty devastating war. People called it the Great War at the time, or the War to End All Wars. Unfortunately, it wasn't. So again, it was called the Great War, and you can see from this illustration how catastrophic and devastating it really was, and how many nations, I know it's tiny, were involved, but you can see Japan, you had Germany, Austria-Hungary, Italy, Turkey, Russia, Great Britain, and eventually the United States entered the war as well. So, as the war approached, or approached, and you guys know this from your imperialism lesson, the nations of Europe were sort of locked in a pretty intense contest, dividing up the nation, and in order, the, the world, and in order to control those, they had to have really strong militaries, they had to be able to flex their military muscles and show the world that they could control that territory. So this is an example, this poster, which is German, and you don't have to read German to really get the message that Germany's going to rule with an iron fist, and it's a really good example of the militaristic and nationalistic propaganda that most nations were engaged in as they built their armies and navies and they um, were competing with each other around the globe. So the first M in militarism that you need to know is, or in the word main, is militarism. So these imperialist nations had sparked an arms race to defend their holdings and possibly gain or regain territory. They were flexing their military might all over. The Industrial Re Revolution sparked industrialization of weapons as well as other cool things like steam engines and telegraphs. Um, and with that became the mass production of weapons and nations wanted the latest, greatest, best, biggest weapons they could come up with. So here you have factory workers, big machines being used on a military scale. So here's military spending pre-World um, War I in contemporary US dollars all the way up to 1913 when the war started and you can see the big spenders Britain even in 1908 was spending 308 million dollars um, you have Italy not so much it's it's not up there but it catches up Germany was the big spender at 396 increasing intensively to 573 way outpacing the British um, by 1913 as the Russians were also big spenders in this area. So you can see that competition before the war. And they like to have big pageants and parades to show off the strength of their army. Um, and this is, I believe, um, done all over Europe. And you would see it in Austria, Hungary, Germany, Britain, just big marching battalions. The A in Maine are alliances and most of these were secret and some of you guys talked about this in your shared inquiry too about how countries would try and work together and work against each other and so they did. They created two systems of alliances the first being the Triple Entente which was made up of Britain, France, and Russia. The other being the Triple Alliance which was Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Italy. So here you can see the rest of the nations were pretty much claiming neutrality, although there were some connections there, but no actual alliances. And these were secret. They didn't know about them. They weren't done in public. The I in Maine is imperialism, what we've been studying. European powers competed with each other for um, raw materials and colonies, so just like our scramble for Africa, playing tug-of-war with the globe. or carving it up, whichever metaphor you like. The N is nationalism. Intense pride in your country or your nation or your nationality or ethnicity. So not only were you flexing your military muscles, but you were super proud to be German or you were super proud to be um, 
Russian or British. Some nations wanted lands that they had had originally um, and had people living in within empires and they wanted those lands back. So for example, the Serbians were living within the Austria-Hungarian Empire and they wanted their homeland back. You had people in France who were French and they were living in a German territory called Alsace-Lorraine and they wanted that back. Other nations wanted to gain independent, national independence from countries that had engulfed their countries. So everybody's flag waving, flag wearing, super patriotic. Here, people showing their Irish pride on an Irish World War I poster. And here are people celebrating Serbian National Day in Kosovo, Serbia. So just remember this acronym when you're wondering what the causes of World War I were. M-A-I-N, the main causes of World War I were militarism, the intense buildup of militaries, armies, and navies, and the industrialization of those militaries, secret alliances and agreements, backdoor dealings, imperialism, intense competition for resources around the world and territories, and intense national pride. So then the war, how did it break out actually? Well, it's funny, it's actually a, a one little event sort of sets off this powder keg. Serbians who were under the control of the Austria-Hungarian Empire wanted their independence. The Archduke Francis Ferdinand of Austria-Hungary is visiting um, Serbia in Sarajevo and while he is there, he is assassinated um, by Serbians. A group called the Black Hand was responsible for his assassination. Austria-Hungary set demands on Serbia, and troops were sent in to enforce those demands. They established martial law and that sort of thing. Um, and as a result of that, a few days later, you have war breaking out. These are images. This is the Archduke and his wife up here, and this is the seizing of the um, assassins. So Russia, who shares a common heritage and similar language to the Serbians, opposed further expansion and declared war on Austria-Hungary. Germany, who was supporting its neighbor, um, Austria-Hungary, declared war on Russia. And Germany, knowing about the alliance between Russia and Britain, also turned around and declared war on France. And France, or declared war on Britain. And then France also declares war on them. So it's like everybody all of a sudden is in a big brawl. So Germany invades Belgium, which was a British ally. Britain declares war on Germany. And there you have it. Everybody in the world, except for the United States, who tries to stay neutral, is in the middle of a big, bloody war. Some newspaper headlines. Britain and France at war with Germany. Germany declares war on Russia. First shots are fired. So the alliances then turn into allies. You have the Triple Entente becomes known as the Allies, so they switch names, and then the Central Powers stay the Central Powers. So what people didn't bargain for is they thought it would be a quick war, they would just go in there and they'd get it done, but what they didn't realize was that all the participants um, thought was going to go well and that they had well-prepared plans for a quick and glorious war. They were going to actually end up sinking in the mud, literally. And the trenches uh, would be hundreds of miles long and vanish along the broad eastern front. And they would end up in what was known as a war of attrition. The, the group that had the most resources poured into it would win, ultimately. So here you can see um, armies in 1914 before the war broke out Russia having the largest army Germany having the next largest army and then France um, Serbia also had a pretty large army at this point so you had some catching up to do by other nations 
And here's an image of the trenches, and these are trees that had been blown to smithereens, basically a big environmental catastrophe also out in the front. Most of it was fought in France, but some of it in Turkey. People had to sell war bonds, basically to get loans to continue to fuel the guns to create ammunition and weapons. Women went to work in factories to um, take the place of men who went to fight in the war. So it was an all-out effort. It was a total war. Everyone in the society in all of these countries ended up sort of working towards the war effort. And you can see it was like this idea, whoever spent the most money would win. Often the Germans were depicted with these types of helmets. They were called Huns. In this case, they're derogatorily um, shown as being pigs. And this is the idea. We'll just mow them over with more stuff and money and troops etc. So let's talk about trench warfare. Trench warfare was new. It was a non-moving battle lines that were dug into the ground facing each other. In World War I, the opposing sides fought each other from their trenches and neither side really gained an advantage. They may gain a few hundred yards or they may gain a few miles, but they just kept digging them longer and longer. On the western front, both sides had trenches that stretched for over 450 miles. So this is an aerial view of the German and British trenches. Um, the British trenches are here on the left. The German trenches are here on the right. Um, I'm sorry, yeah, to the right. And Yeah, I read that right. Uh -huh. um, so this area between the two was filled with barbed wire, um, and it was called No Man's Land right in here. These zigzags were used so that they would avoid artillery fire being directly hit by them. You also had trenches connecting the front line trench to the rear trenches. These were communication trenches. And they could be pretty elaborate. So here you can see they would have bunkers in some cases, underground dugouts where people would make plans. You can see pock marks and holes. Those were from big art, long range artillery shells that were behind the front lines. They would often fire into the no man's land trying to break through the barbed wire. Then um, the whistle would be blown and people would charge up and out of the, the trenches to fight. Often people got caught in the barbed wire and then they were just sort of sitting ducks. So they tried to keep the mud out of them. They would sometimes put boards in them to, to keep them and retaining walls they would build. They were, like I said, pretty elaborate. And they had the barbed wire, which was really thick, out on the no man's land. So here you can see an image of it. You have people sleeping, resting, taking their turn, um, taking a break in a British tent, trench in 1916. These are German trenches in a French forest that was devastated by the war, and you can see this once was a thick forest, but the trees were pretty much all decimated. Yep, the whistle would be blown, and you would be going over the top, and you would literally scramble up out of your trenches and try to charge into the enemy's trenches, crossing through that no man's land. So all of this resulted in a stalemate. Troops dug in and little progress was made. Thousands of men died and no real territory was gained. New technology industrialized warfare. We mass produced death during this war. And you can see how far the Germans advanced. This is right here, 1914. And by 1918, they hadn't gotten much further. So it was really a futile effort and people started to get really fatigued and could tell it wasn't really working. I think we'll start in a minute with conditions in the trenches.